Hey, how's it going? Welcome to episode 7 of Sound Editing for Visual Media, a series all about post-production audio for film and television. In this episode, we're going to tackle compression. If EQ is the salt of audio production, compression is the pepper. Just like last week with EQing, I'm going to leave most of the technical stuff for the blog post. So if you don't know what compressors are, definitely have a read through of that. I will, however, give you a crash course of what compressors are, bust some myths along the way. And then I'm going to show you five things compressors are used for in sound design and editing. The blog will go into a lot more detail as always, but let's just jump into Reaper and get started. Now to teach compression, I'll be looking for a sound that has a big transient and kind of a long tail. So this is the sound I picked. Let's hear it. Whoa, way too loud. We should probably compress it, right? Wrong. That's the first compression myth is that you need to compress everything. You don't. If you're using compression to control volume, then why not just use the volume control? Just by turning down my item, it's no longer clipping, and then I can evaluate whether I need to compress or not. For the sake of education though, let's do it. I'm going to drag C1 comp stereo onto the item. You can use whatever compressor you have. I'm choosing this compressor because it has a visual display we can use to explain compression. When you open it, you see a graph with a straight line. Along the X axis, you have input gain. This shows you the volume going into the compressor. The Y axis is the output gain. Right now, we haven't set a threshold or a ratio, so whatever comes in the compressor, it goes out the same level. As I bring the threshold down, we're asking the compressor to start applying gain reduction to our audio past a certain amount. That's what compressors do, they reduce gain. If compressors didn't exist, we could do what they do with a volume control, but it would take us ages. So I brought the threshold down, but our line is still straight. That's because our ratio is still one to one. Ratio in compression is expressed with one number against the number one. So a ratio of two to one cuts the dynamic range above the threshold by half, meaning if my audio pre-compression goes 20 dB over the threshold, after compressing it would only go 10 dB above. Right now my ratio is set at 2.4 to 1, so that means for every 2.4 dB of increase past the threshold, only 1 dB of increase is output. So when my line is in that curvy area, as you can clearly see, the, the output volume has reduced drastically. Once it gets the straight line and below the threshold, it just goes down as it normally did before. So alright, quick pop quiz. If you want your audio's loudest bit to be minus 20, should you set the threshold at minus 20? Let's take 5 seconds to think about this. Okay, so if you answered no, then you're right. The threshold doesn't actually dictate the maximum volume of an audio, just where the compressor kicks in. However, if we know the threshold and the ratio, we can calculate the volume ceiling. If my threshold is at minus 20 and my ratio is 2 to 1, the ceiling of a normalized audio track is minus 10 dB. 20 dB of headroom cut in half added to the threshold. I'll leave these formulas in the blog post and explain them in further detail. Now I hear more veteran viewers saying, hold on. What about the attack value? Wouldn't that let the audio go above the ceiling for the attack amount? And the answer to that is no. And this is the second compressor myth. A lot of people think the attack time is the time it takes the compressor to begin working after we exceed the threshold. But think about it. If that's how compressors work, they'd be kind of useless. They wouldn't tackle our loudest peaks. But also, what if they kicked in after that amount? Do they just immediately go down 6 dB? That would sound horrible. Also, if they're waiting for the attack time to kick in before tackling the threshold, then that threshold amount is actually very arbitrary as well. To illustrate this, I'm going to switch to another compressor from Neutron 3 by Isotope. This compressor has a slightly different display. X axis is displaying time and the Y axis displays loudness. The orange line shows the volume envelope that the compressor is applying. This way we can see the effect of attack and release. I'm going to set my threshold at minus 20, ratio to 2 to 1, attack at 20 milliseconds and release at 100. As I play the item, you can clearly see that the envelope kicks in right at the time that our signal exceeds minus 20 dB. It kicks in immediately, however, it doesn't instantly jump to full reduction because that would sound horrible. It takes some time to go to max reduction and that time is 20 milliseconds as our attack dictates. After that, you can see that it takes 100 milliseconds to restore the volume back to the amount it was. Also notice that it kicks in after we exceed and it doesn't remain triggered for as long as our signal remains above the threshold. With our current attack and release times, we are simply creating volume envelopes of 120 milliseconds long and whatever happens in this interim is irrelevant to the compressor. Once 120 milliseconds pass and the signal goes below, the compressor is once again ready for applying a new volume envelope when the threshold is exceeded. 
So that was a very quick crash course. Compression is a very complicated topic. While you may not need all the math involved to understand it, a solid theoretical knowledge is helpful. You can always rely on your ears as you tune them, but I at least hope that you now understand that a meme is not gonna help you understand compression. There's a lot of myths surrounding the topic of compression, and I only got to two of them in this crash course in the interest of time. In the blog, I will write more on this topic and bust a couple more myths, like the one everybody likes to repeat about how compressors destroy your transients. It's just nonsense. But anyway, theoretical knowledge is only half the battle. Let's see compressors in action. Now compressors are not something you need to put on every single sound effect. Simply put, they are a tool in our toolbox and we use them when there are certain tasks we need to complete. I'm gonna show you five such tasks that we use compressors to achieve in sound editing and sound design and then we'll fucking call it a day. So I got this scene here and I found some field fully that I edited so that it synced to picture. Guys walk in, sees the person, shoots. Very simple. This is from a film called Sniper. Thanks to Rise Productions for letting us use this video. I'm gonna put the link to the film in the description and give them some love because they are helping me provide you with this info. Okay, so we got these footsteps. They are not well leveled. So we can use volume automation to even them out, but it's gonna take too long. So using compressor is appropriate here. So let's listen to this. As you can hear, one of the footsteps is considerably louder than the other ones. And that's the one that occurs when our protagonist kind of sees the other dude. And that footstep is louder, it's conveying more stress. But we do want to get the level difference a little bit under control. So I'm looking to set a threshold amount that catches at least a bit of the quieter transients. And then for the loudest transient, it will be, you know, that will well exceed our threshold. So once I have the threshold where I like it, I'm going to play with the ratio. And I don't want to completely squash the level difference between these footsteps, but I want the loudest one to just be a little bit louder than the quieter ones, and not a huge amount that makes it harder to mix. So those settings work for me. Something you can do when you're learning to compress is to constantly print your compressors so that you can view the waveform and the change it's made. Okay, so this was our original sound. And now that we glued it, we can see that most of the peaks are about at the same level. And as you can see, despite me putting a five millisecond attack on there, there's not like five milliseconds of this poking out, obviously, right? Now they're within the same level. And obviously we want this to be slightly louder because that's kind of the moment where, you know, he suddenly sees somebody and now he's about to shoot. Now there's another thing I want to do with the compressor. I kind of like the texture of sounds between these footsteps, all this like scraping along the leaves and stuff like that. So for that, we can use upward compression. So what we've been doing so far was downward compression. We reduce the dynamic range by bringing down the loudest parts of the signal. Upward compression reduces the dynamic range by bringing up the quietest parts of the signal. So the way to apply upward compression, obviously you can use something like the OTT and the OTT already has downward and upward compression built into it. The reason I'm not using it right now is because this is not a very visual plugin. So if you're learning, it's better to just still use another compressor that gives us a little more visual information. So I'm gonna bring in another one of the Seacom stereo. So in the first compressor, we evened out the level of everything. So everything hovers around this amount, kind of from minus 60-ish to minus 20-ish, right? So now we can clearly see that the audio coming out of the C1 hovers around this area. So I'm gonna bring the threshold to be way below that area. Let's set it to minus 60. Now I'm gonna set the ratio to be under two to one. Let's just put it at 1.5. So when we have it at 1.5, obviously we are just kind of taking this sound and we're squashing it a little bit. Next, what I'm gonna do is use the makeup gain to bring up this whole amount. So anything that was at minus 60 is now a little bit at like minus 13 or something. And everything else is a little squashed. So we brought up a lot of like that crunch of the leaves and stuff like that. Let's print that and see how that looks. So as you can see, this time our peaks are still in control, but these kind of textural elements have gone up a little bit. So now let's listen to this sound. Perfect. Now the amount is almost where we want it in terms of loudness overall. It's not going to overpower the music or anything like that, but we're also kind of hearing the texture of the footsteps on like a forest floor. So that's really nice. Because we compressed the whole signal, we obviously introduced some noise. Let's listen to that noise. 
it's not too much. So once you have BG tracks and possibly some dramatic music and things like that, that noise is not going to cause an issue. But in case it does for you, you can use EQ to get rid of that. Essentially, we use one compressor to even out the level difference between these footsteps. And then we used upward compression to bring up these kind of in-between areas where we're hearing the texture of the forest floor. And we got ourselves a nice little Foley track that's very expressive. Now, from this point, I can kind of play with the level if I need to. And, you know, that's that's the mixer's job to kind of mix that in. But I think the quality of this sound is pretty neat. So that's the first use. So last week we had this rain track that we were working on and we EQ'd it to how we liked it. But as you can see, there's this stuff kind of like in the high end that like jumps around a little too much. And we can see it in the waveform as well. There's just a little bit of sharpness to it. And the problem is once we mix that in, those sharpest peaks are gonna like poke out of the mix a little bit and it's gonna be a little hard to mix. Now we don't want to just bring it down with EQing because we're losing so much of the characteristic of the rain. As I bring it down, I'm just making the rain a lot less kind of interesting. And we're not really taking care of the problem of those things poking out anyway. So I'm going to put the EQ back to where it was. And instead, we're going to use a compressor. So I have the C4 compressor. And as you can see in the high end, I've set the threshold down to catch most of the places that they poke out a lot. It's keeping those a lot more under control. And as you can see, this is our input gain and our output gain is considerably less active, but that still doesn't solve our whole problem. So then I also brought in a limiter. Now a limiter is just a compressor. It just has a much higher ratio and a much faster attack. So it really works on everything. After compressing, this is what our waveform looked like. And this is what it sounds like. The overall thickness of the audio form is a lot more even. So here we can see that here it's a little louder. In some places a little thinner. This one is more evened out, but it still has things that poke out. So we got those further under control using a limiter. And again, we don't want to completely squash them because that would be unnatural. But if I just turn this down to kind of be around minus 30, this can easily sit as a BG track under all our audio and just put the audience in the correct environment of a rain scene. This is also a good loop because it ends at a zero crossing and starts at a zero crossing. And that way you can't tell that it's being loop. It's not causing any kind of difference. So let's listen from the end back to the beginning. I didn't hear anything that would indicate that this is a loop. So despite the duration being quite short, I can actually lay this down on a much longer scene. So that's how you flatten BG tracks so that they are at an even loudness. So once you like bring them down, they can just be a bit. I used the analogy last week that you don't want to lay on a bed if there are nails poking out of it. You want to lay on a bed that is more or less even. So that's a little bit on how to use compression to flatten BG tracks so that they can sit well in the mix. So back to the movie Sniper and there's this scene here. Let's watch it first. This guy is being blackmailed by a sniper and in this scene, the sniper shoots. So suddenly shit starts to kick up. You see that ricochet sound that they have here. We want to kind of induce a lot of stress when that bullet hits the wood, right? So I found this bullet flyby sound. Let's listen to it. So I want to make this a little more scary than it is right now. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring another compressor. I'm going to loop this. So if we just turn this up, the loudest part of the audio will definitely clip. And that loud part only occurs for a very small fraction of time. So if I only get that fraction of time under control with a compressor, it gives me a lot of headroom to bring the whole thing up. So now what we did very simply is that we made this a lot more impactful. So let's watch it without compression. Yeah, and now with compression. Obviously it's a lot louder and that's impactful. But the other thing that's happening is that I'm hearing the bullet travel through air more. That's sounding a lot better. And then obviously we need an impact sound, but by compressing it, A, we made it a lot louder and overall we made it a little more scary and kind of like, I think we made the audience kind of feel it more and get more stressed out by this sound. If I once again glue this, you can see we added a lot more information in these areas where the bullet is traveling through the air. So that's two uses for compression in one. Let's move on to the last thing. 
So last week we discussed how to use EQ to make something sound further away than it is. Now while EQ is a great tool to achieve this, it's not the only tool. Compressors could also contribute to this. They can make something that's recorded close by feel further away. What I got here is a video of me hitting a frying pan from close and then from a little bit further away. So let's watch it real quick. They don't sound too different to our ears, but let's use a spectrograph. I explain how this works in one of my videos, which I'll link up there. So those are the two different hits. And now I'm slowing down the video and you can clearly see that the second one, which was recorded from further away, is a lot quieter in the high end, which is what we explained in the last video. Something that's harder to see is how their envelopes are different. But I'm gonna show you using a compressor how something can be made to feel further away than it is. So let's go back to the movie Sniper and I'll show you. All right, back to the movie Sniper and we got this scene where these two guys are shooting at each other. So we get to this scene and I want to make this gunshot sound sound further away because we're seeing it from further away and we're trying to put the audience kind of in the shoes of the protagonist. And I got this sound. But let's look at our spectrograph. And we can see that it does have a lot of high end. So okay, we can fix that with an EQ. Shift wax, zoink, joink, scroop. Sounds further away. Let's look at our spectrograph as well. Already feeling a little further away, but there's something missing. It's still sounding like that initial impact is traveling to our ear way too fast. So this is another thing you can manipulate with a compressor. So I want to bring this compressor here. And this time I'm going to set the attack really low. So let's set it to just one millisecond. So in this one millisecond, the sound is coming down a lot. And based on our distance, I wanted to compress this not too much. Maybe just 3.2 to 1. So let's hear it. Because again, we're trying to make it sound further away, to me it makes sense if I brought the threshold down and then I added some makeup gain. So again, what we're doing is making the environment heard more while not making our audio clip. Maybe even we have a little more headroom. Let's do like this. This is without anything. It sounds very close to my ear. Now this is with the EQ better and now it's with a compressor added so one more time eq compressor added right so we increase the tail and that's kind of how things sound when they're further away the attack of the transient is a little less pronounced let's see it on a spectrograph lots of high end very close to our ears now let's add the eq The high end is a little more in control. And now let's add the compressor. So these tails are characteristic of something being further away. And overall, I think just to your ear, just by listening to it, we made it sound a lot further away. So EQ is only half the equation, compressors, and adjusting the envelope of a sound also contributes to it sounding further away. So that's just something to keep in mind. So that's it for today's video. Once again, I'd like to thank Rice Productions for letting us use footage from the movie Sniper. Definitely check that movie out. The link of that will be in the description as well. Once again, I edited out a lot of details and left some of the more technical info and some more debunking of compression myths to the blog post. So definitely check it out. I will also include a few articles and other video tutorials by other creators on the topic of compression so you can study further. These last two videos weren't really Reaper related. I mean, EQ and compressors work the same way no matter what DAW you're in. But from next week, we're gonna go back to focusing on Reaper a little bit more. What I want to do next week is break down a sound design editing project that I did in Reaper. The final mix of that project is up on my channel, so I'll put the link up there for you to check it out if you want. It's only 30 seconds, but next week we're gonna get into the session, we're gonna break it down. So A, I'll show you tons of sound design tricks, and B, you're gonna see what a finished project looks like and how I organize my project. So a lot of the stuff that we covered in the last seven episodes, we're gonna bring it all together. So stay tuned, take care of yourself, and I'll see you next Wednesday. Bye-bye.